So, of course, today we're celebrating Father's Day, this Sunday, and then this morning I've got a sermon geared towards the, the fathers, not just the fathers, fathers and husbands out there, but um, even though it might be geared more towards the men, the women, so listen up, there's a lot to be learned from the sermon this morning, um, all Scripture is given for, um, you know, for doctrine, for proof, for instruction, righteousness. So there's, there's good reason to, to, to hear all this stuff anyways. And we touch on a variety of topics. And um, when I was preparing for the sermon, I was thinking, well, who better of an example to use than Abraham when we're looking for a godly example of, uh, of somebody that we can look to for guidance on how we ought to be, you know, as fathers running the household and raising our children. And the, the title of my sermon this morning is Fathers, Rule Your House Well. Rule Your House Well. Now, right, a right off the bat in this world, the title is going to offend somebody. Because the whole concept of men ruling their household has gone by the wayside and is looked down upon. And people are going to think, oh, I can't believe you just said that. What do you mean? Are you this old, you know, are you this, this ancient, you know, uh, barbarian that thinks that the, the man should be ruling the household? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I believe that, that the, the father, the man, the husband is the one who is in charge of his household. But let's look at some, before I even get ahead of myself, there's a lot to this sermon, but um, let's look at Abraham as a person, as a father, as a husband, and we get a lot from Abraham's character and personality here in chapter 18. And a lot, of, a lot of his godly attributes are found here in chapter 18. Let's look down at verse number one where we started reading here. The Bible says, And the Lord appeared on him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. So it's real hot out, and Abraham's just kind of relaxing in, in, in his door of his tent where he lives in the heat of the day. And he lifts up his eyes, it says in verse two, and looked, and lo, Three men stood by him, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. So Abraham gets visitors. There's three men coming to see Abraham. Now, it says that the Lord appeared unto him, but it's not um, obvious from the scripture whether or not Abraham knew at the beginning that he's talking to the Lord. You know, we don't, we don't know that for sure. But either way, we see, okay, when he gets some visitors show up, he runs out to meet them. You know, he's not dragging his feet or not caring about them. And, oh, well, it's hot out today, so I'm just going to keep sitting here. They could come over to me. You know, that's not the attitude that Abraham had. He got up. He ran to meet them. He bowed down himself, greeted them, you know, showed respect unto them coming to his house, verse 3, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. So he's saying, Look, before you guys go, just continue on your journey. You're, you've come to my house, come to my house, Get some rest, wash your feet. I'm going to make you some food. You know, you'll refresh yourself and then you can be on your way. But let me help you out. We see the hospitality of Abraham and his willingness to just open up the door to his house, to help a stranger in need, to help them out, give them some food, refresh them and serve them. He's not just, um, you know, he, he's really going the extra mile to, to help these men out to help out the, who happen to be the Lord and his angels, but um, he's, he's doing everything he can to, to be hospitable and to help other people out. And this is a good attribute to have. And, you know, as a, as a man, as a father, as, as, as a woman, I mean, everybody should have attributes like this, being hospitable. Verse number six, we're going to see here the respect that Abraham had in order to command his household and his household to listen to him. So these guests show up. So in his heart, what does he want to do? I want to help these guys out. I'm going to make a meal for them. They could just sit here and relax. I'm going to do all the work. But he can't do everything by himself. He goes into the house and he says um, in verse number six, and Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. You know what we don't see here? Oh, why don't you get the meal and you knead it yourself? 
You know, we don't see here, we don't see Abraham just going and doing it. And he says, he comes into his wife and he says, look, we've got guests here. You need to make ready quickly. Three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. I need you to do this. And without a fight, without talking back, without anything else, what does she do? She goes and does it. Praise God. Another, and Sarah is a godly example of a wife, by the way, as well. And we went over that a little bit on Mother's Day this year. And not only that, look at verse number seven. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. So now he's getting the meat ready, right? He's, he's at, she's making the bread, and he's like, well, we need to have meat too. So he's like, here, you do this to another man of his household, another young man, um, he had hired servants and such in his household, but he commanded respect. When he went in and told his wife to do something, she did it. When he told his, 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 this young man to, to, to dress it, he did it, and he did it quickly. He wasn't dragging his feet. They were all working with the same attitude that Abraham had towards these other men. See, if you're going to lead, if you're going to be a good ruler, a good leader in your household, it's not just being Mr. Dictator. You lead the best by example. Now, you have the authority of a dictator in the house, according to Scripture, and we're going to see that in a minute. I'm going to prove that to you. God has given the man of the house the authority over that household. But the way that you run your house should not just be, you know, if you want to do it well, it shouldn't just be, this is the rules and, and, you, don't, and you don't do and act the way that you want the other people to follow you as. See, we have Abraham going out and being hospitable. We have Abraham showing respect unto other people that came to his house. We see Abraham being friendly and to, to other people, and in turn, he's getting things done in order to achieve that, that friendliness, and everybody's working towards the same goal. Everyone in the house is on the same page. Abraham was not just some mean old guy you know, that, that everybody hated in his household. He commanded, he was ruling, but he was ruling well. People didn't have a problem listening to him. And, and husbands, fathers, if you have a problem with people listening to you in your household, you're probably not doing something right. You ought to be able to command respect. You ought to be able to have your family listen to you. And a lot of that's going to come from a lack of hypocrisy on your part. If you're telling people to do stuff, you know, you ought not to be, you know, you ought not to be saying, well, do what I say, not as I do, and just, and just telling people to do things. Now, you may be right, but why don't you shape up your act and not be doing the things you don't expect your kids to do? Because your kids are going to learn way more by looking at you than they are going to be by listening to you. It's just a fact. They're going to see the things that you do and they think, well, dad's doing this. What, what impact is that to say, oh, this is wrong, don't do it as you're doing it right in front of them? Oh, yeah, kids, don't ever smoke. It's bad for you, don't ever smoke. And they see you doing it. And if they love you and have any respect for you, they say, well, dad's doing it. And that's what they're going to learn. So, one, dads, you need to get your act in gear and make sure that the way that you want your house to be run is the way that you're living your life and be that example. We're going to see here now, he, he commanded his family. Look at verse number eight. Now he, he has, you know, he had everyone working for him, getting this stuff done. And then he got involved too. It says in verse eight, and he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. So he comes and he serves them. So he's not, Abraham's not alone. He's not making everyone else do the work. He's getting involved too. And as the head of the household, again, the one, the one in charge, he could have sent anyone else out to serve them. He took it on himself to take all the prepared food and serve these people that, that came into his house. And he stood there. When it says he stood there by the tree while they ate, he's waiting on them. He's not even sitting down and eating with them. He took on the role of a servant. He's saying, okay, here, here's some food. Here's some drink, you know, and I'm going to stand right here. You need anything? Oh, you need a napkin? Oh, you need a fork? Oh, you know, like, what do you need? And he is there ready to get it for them so that they could enjoy themselves and the attention is being put on his guests. And this is the way that Abraham was. This is the way that he presented himself. We get a glimpse into his life. 
And I think this is one of the reasons why he commands so much respect. But one of the greatest things about this story, in my opinion, is the way that God thought about Abraham and how God knew who Abraham was and the type of man that he was. Look at verse number 19. Verse number 19, when God's trying to determine whether or not he wants to tell Abraham what they're actually going to do, what they're actually going, you know, the, the mission that they're on to go into Sodom and destroy it. He considers Abraham and who he is. Verse number 19 says, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Too many fathers today are not stepping up to their job as the head of the household. Now, we saw earlier being head of the household, he's, he's commanding his, his house to do certain things for him, just to do specific acts. But not just that, the more important job of just then being in charge and having people do things is teaching your children and commanding them in the ways of the Lord. Amen. Being not only physically, you know, the head of the house, getting things done, but spiritually the head of the household and teaching your family the right ways, the truth, righteousness, judgment, everything that's right, the way that your family is supposed to be going. Hey, if your children start doing things and getting into sin and getting into wickedness, dad, you are in charge. The buck stops with you. Now, the Bible talks a great deal about moms raising and rearing their children godly ways. You know, and, and amen and amen, and that's God's design. And he wants, you know, the, the mothers teaching and training and raising up their children. But you know what? At the end of the day, do you know who's responsible? Dad, it's you. You are the one that you, you know, people want to pass off the blame. And the kids say, oh, well, my parents didn't raise me. You know, Mom didn't raise me right. Oh, mom you know, has another excuse. You know what? At the end, it can't go past dad. Dad is at the top of that chain when it comes to the way that your household is going to be run and the things that are going to be taught. And, you know, dads, husbands, if your wife's not doing the job that, that you think they should be doing, you need to get involved. You have to get involved. You can't just blame, just say, well, she's not doing it. Well, guess what? You're responsible. I mean, it, it, think about, think about it, it, it's so easy to think about the family in, in terms of, uh, of uh, a workplace, if you will. Because it, 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 a lot of people have experience with this. Imagine just being at a workplace and an employee being, this is your position, this is, you know, there's the boss, right? You've got the boss. Let's make it real simple. I'm not going to outline an entire big corporation. You work for someone, you've got a boss. And you are given a job to do. You're hired for a job. And you have other people working there too. And you see one employee just not doing what they're supposed to be doing, not doing what they're told. I don't know about you. I've never had a boss that would just throw his like, oh, I don't know about this person. You know, like, just can't do anything with them. Oh, well, I guess I'm just going to focus on other things and not worry about the employee that's not doing the job that I hired him to do. No boss, is, no boss I've ever met is like that. And if there is, you know, any bosses that are like that is not a good boss and their whole business is going to crumble if they're going to be leading their company that way. Because the bottom line is when the boss says, this is your job and this is what you're supposed to be doing, then you do it. Now, in the, in the company aspect, if you, you know, if you don't, uh, if you don't perform, you get fired. Now, it's not exactly this. That doesn't, that doesn't cross over to the family. Okay, you don't. But I mean, in this world, that seems to be the way it is. People just want to get divorced over everything. But you should have way more invested in your family anyways than just like a business, right? A business out to make money. How much more valuable is your, is your wife and children to you? You know, you don't just turn head, look the other way and say, oh, I don't know what she's doing. She's crazy. She's not doing what I'm doing. You need to get involved and figure out how to get things right in your house. Whether the problem's with your, with your spouse, whether the problem's with your children, no matter where the problem is coming from, you need to step involved, get involved, and make sure that you are making things happen the way that you want things to be. Don't be this, this you know, no spine, no backbone type of a father or husband. You see wickedness creeping into your house. The TV's getting turned on or something. You know, your wife comes home with something that, that you don't agree with, that you think is just wicked, and you, that you shouldn't have that in your house. 
bring an idolatry in your house, bring anything like that. You know what it is, Dad? It's your job. Husband, it's your job to say, we're not going to have this trash in this household and you need to have the backbone to stand up and you know what? Maybe that's going to mean an argument. Maybe that's going to mean some type of a fight, but you need to be able to stand up and stand up for what's right and say, no, this is the way this house is going to be run. This is what we do. I'm in charge here. And you know, just a just, I just want to prove this to you. You're in Genesis 18. Flip back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 3. Because there's absolutely no question, and this is an important point, there's absolutely no question about who God has given authority to in the home. Amen. No doubt about it. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. This is just as important for the ladies to hear as the men. Women and men alike need to hear this and see what the Bible says on this subject. Genesis 3, of course, is the story of Adam and Eve. And, and Eve was deceived by the serpent into eating the fruit that God forbade them not to eat. And, of course, the, Satan deceived her. And then she got her husband to commit the sin also. So God brings judgment upon them. And one of those judgments found in verse 16, unto Eve, it says, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So one of the things that's, that's meted out, one of the judgments that God hands out is saying, okay, because of this sin, this is the way things are going to be from now on. Your conception, having children, is going to be with sorrow. It's going to, you know, the labor is going to be painful. There's going you know, to be more things that you have to go through now as a result of your sin. And your desire is going to be your husband, meaning that you're going to be looking to him. He's going to be ruling over you. He's going to rule over you. You say, oh, that was just Adam and Eve. No, it's not. Let's go to the New Testament. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 in the New Testament. I mean, that's right off the bat. Chapter 3 of Genesis is, is pretty early on where we start seeing God making man and woman. And for this cause, man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And right away we see the, the, the power structure being set up with the man being in charge. Ephesians chapter 5. And I recommend you read this entire chapter, but we're going to just look at um, a couple verses here. Verse number 22. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse number 22. The Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And I've gone over this many times where you think about how, how submissive and obedient you should be to the Lord, to God. He's saying, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. That's strong language. It really is. That's saying, wow, you know, I should have that type of an attitude, a submissive attitude towards my husband. Yes. Now, we know that God is at the height of all rule and all power, so his authority covers all. So anyone underneath that authority does, cannot say to do something against God's authority. Right? So even though wives are supposed to submit themselves unto their husband as unto the Lord, if your husband is telling you to do something that is against what the Lord said to do, then that is outside of the husband's authority to say, to say anything against God's rules. But anything short of that falls under this category. Look at verse number 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, I'm not just saying this for the wives to hear. The wives need to hear this and understand and have that heart that this is my role, that I am to be submissive to my husband. But husbands, listen up. 
Because this is the position that God has put you in. If your wife is going to be submissive and, and hearing everything that you say, you better be saying the right things. You better be doing the right things. You better be leading in the right way. Because your wife is supposed to be listening to you. Your wife is supposed to be doing what you say to do. That puts a burden on you as a leader. When, when you're in charge of anything, when you're in charge of a group, especially a group of people or your family or whoever it is, that is an extra responsibility. People say, oh man, yeah, you husband, you know, the men, uh, they have all the power and everything else and, and how great it is. Well, yeah, it may seem great, but then we actually take on the responsibility. There's a lot of stress and a lot of burden involved with that as well. If you're going to be making sure things are done right, you're adding a, a big workload to yourself and especially over a family that you care and love about. It would be a lot easier to try to shift your responsibility to somebody else and it may be tempting to want to shift your responsibility to someone else. But God has put the responsibility on you. Now, I'm not talking about asking your wife to help you in certain areas when you're commanding and ruling and saying, hey, I need help with this. Get this done for me. That's different than sharing the actual responsibility for the things that are done. See, at the end of the day, you can't be blaming your wife for, for the way things are going out, for the way your kids are turning out. Look, you are responsible. You have that responsibility. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter number 2. Just a few more pages to the right. You're in Ephesians, go through Philippians and Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and then 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. We're talking about God giving the authority unto the man in the household. Proving from Scripture. We've already seen a couple of references. We're going to see one more right here. And this isn't all of them, by the way. This is just a few to get the point across. 1 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 11. The Bible says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, usurping authority is, is you're, you're taking something that's not yours. God hasn't given you that authority, but when, you know, when a woman's usurping the authority, she's taking something that wasn't given to her. And in this context, it's talking about a woman learning in science and not teaching. Nor do you usurp authority over the man. What does that mean? That the man was given authority over the woman. And if the woman starts taking the authority over the man, she's usurping that authority. It says, but to be in silence for Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. It gives a reasoning behind that as far as the teaching and stuff goes. And see, that's why men, you are the spiritual teacher and leader in the household. It, apparently it's easier by nature for women to be deceived, to be led down the wrong path because God has designed the women to be led. To be submissive, to not be the ones in charge. That was God's plan and God's design. So by nature, it's a little bit easier for women to then be deceived because she's looking to be led. And the Bible says that Adam was not deceived. Now he still sinned, but he wasn't fooled about it. See, Eve was deceived into thinking that, oh, well, maybe this is okay. The devil, you know, tricked her, lied, and said, yo, yay, hath God these are questioning God's word and saying, see, look, God knows that when you eat this, you're going to be like, you know, and, and tempting her with all these various things and tricked her into thinking that it actually wasn't that bad, that it was actually a good thing for her to do. She was deceived, but Adam was not deceived. He knew it was wrong, but he did it anyway. So we go on all the reasons why he did that. We're not going to do that this morning. The bottom line is it's crystal clear in the Bible who has the authority in the household. The father, the husband, has the authority in the household. Now, Sarah is referred to many times as a very godly woman in the Bible. She had a lot of wisdom, and she's referred to multiple places, how, how godly she is and, and the type of spirit that she had. But do you, think, do you really think she was the one running the family and teaching Abraham? And see, women need to be aware of this, that... Maybe you do no more in the Bible than your husband knows. 
Maybe that's a fact. Okay? But if you decide to start being the teacher and telling, you know, your husband the way things are going to be in your house, you are usurping his authority that God has given him. That's not the role that God has given you. You may have the best of intentions, but it's not right for you to do that. And husbands, men, listen up because that is your job. And if your wife knows more than you, I mean, praise God that she knows a lot of the Bible, but shame on you for not putting forth your effort and due diligence to know and learn the Bible for yourself to be able to teach your wife. When the Bible talks about, you know, the women are to keep silence in the church, and if they'll learn anything that they could go and ask their husbands at home, that means that they're going to be looking to you for the answers, husbands. So if your wife's going to be looking to you for answers, you better have the answers. You better be able to explain things to them. You better be able to teach them as your role requires you to do. With your role, with that authority, comes a lot of responsibility and being able to fill the role that God has for you. This is not something to be taken lightly. You better work hard to make sure you're the leader in your family in all areas, but especially spiritually. Part of being a good leader in the home is going to be having the strength to endure. If you want to be a good father, if you, and if things are going to be done right, you're going to need to be strong. You're going to need to be strong-willed. When you know something's right in your house, you need to have the strength to not back down and to make sure that things are done and that there is no compromise, there is no backing down when, when you decide this is the way it is, just as much as you see, thus saith the Lord in the Bible, you say, that's true, that's the word of God, you need to have that attitude in the home. Say, hey, if thus saith the Lord, then thus saith me in this household. This is the way things are going to be. And you need to be strong because there's going to be conflict. It's going to happen. We're human beings. And it's not because... You know, you don't have to have this attitude that you're always right. And women, look, it's not that your husband is always right about everything. It's that he's an authority and that he's in charge. I don't think that my boss at work is right about everything, you know, all the, all the things that he has me do sometimes and the work that he put, gives me to do. I think there's better ways of doing things. I, if it were my business, I would do things different. But you know what? It's not my business. And he's the boss. So you know what I do? Yes, sir. Now, with a good relationship with him, I may be able to humbly bring up or suggest some other things for him to consider. But at the end of the day, yes, sir. I'll do it. Whatever you want me to do, that's, that's, I'll do it. And that's the way things need to be in the household. So men are in charge. You, you, you may disagree with your husband on things, ladies, but... You can disagree and you could try to maybe entreat or talk to your husband. But at the end of the day, if he's saying this is the way things are going to be, then you need to listen. And husbands have the strength to be able to say, you know what? Even if there's going to be conflict, even if it's not pleasant for a while, because look, nobody likes to fight or very few people do. I'm not one that likes a fight. I would much rather have zero conflict. I don't like it. I mean, it, you know, it, it, you feel bad, your stomach gets all messed up and naughty, and, you know, it's just, it's not fun. It's not fun. It's not the way you want to live your life all the time. But you know what? Sometimes it's necessary. And if things are going to be done right, and if you're going to be in charge, you're going to have to deal with the uncomfortableness of a conflict, and you're going to need to be able to stand your ground and say, this is the way things are going to be done in our household. And you must stay strong and maintain your authority over the house. I'm not perfect by any means. Believe me. I am far from it. And I'm not going to say that I'm the best example of a husband. But I'm going to use a few instances of my personal life without getting too detailed because I don't think it's appropriate, but 
things that I think are probably common to many people in marriage and the things that, that I've had to do to, uh, to rule my household. Now, I may be far from perfect. I'm not trying to lift myself up, but I've already been deemed by having this position I have here and being ordained to be a pastor that I have ruled my household well. And it's already been determined by other people outside looking in that I at least have the qualifications to pastor as found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, that a pastor needs to rule his house well, keeping his children in subjection. So, again, I'm not trying to lift myself up, but if you want a reason to listen to somebody, at least, at least there's that, right? I'm not saying that everything I do in my house is right and every situation I've done everything perfect. By, you know, definitely not. But there has been many conflicts in our own household that had to be settled because I'm the one in charge and I'm the one that's going to dictate how things are going to be in our household. And this isn't a slam on my wife either, by the way. I love my wife. I think she's a very godly woman. And, and you know, there's just things that happen within marriage. It's like you get two people come together and start living together and you're different and we're both sinners. You know, you got, you got problems that need to be fixed. Well, guess what though? The dad, husband, you're the one in charge of making sure things go right in that household. Now, personally, when me and my wife got married, my wife was a young Christian. She had just gotten saved maybe a year prior to our marriage. And she was not raised in a Christian household. She did not have a lot of the upbringing. So a lot of things were new. So I had to balance the way things are going to be in my household with allowing a new Christian to grow. Because you have to have grace in areas. And, and even as, as a leader, as a ruler, look, you cannot demand just perfection every single time. And if you don't have absolute perfection, you're going to fly off the handle. I mean, that's not going to work. You need to have grace and humility and be able to show you know, some mercy and everything else. It, the, the point is to grow and to continue to get better. But there are certain areas and certain aspects of your life where you're going to say, you know what, this, this is not going to happen in my household. For example, and this wasn't an issue, but in my household, we got married and said, there is zero alcohol in my household. Zero. We are not going to have beer, wine coolers. I don't care what it is. We are going to have no alcohol in this house. Not going to happen. And if she were, and she, this didn't happen, but if, if my wife were to show up one day from the store, she went grocery shopping or something, and I see a six pack in the fridge or whatever, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take those things, I'm going to either bust them or, or pour them down the drain, and I'm going to say, don't you ever buy this crap again. And be no uncertain terms about it. This is not going to be in my household. If you keep buying it, I'm going to keep pouring it out, and you know, it's going to stop here. And you need to just draw, make that line in the sand and draw and say, this is the way things are going to be in our household. We had conflicts over many things. I mean, whether over uh, the things that, that uh, she was going to wear. You know, and, and she didn't have, at the time, early on, the same convictions or the same even necessarily belief or understanding about the Bible that I did. But I was the one in charge. I didn't want my wife wearing pants. I see what the Bible says that, that uh, it's abomination for a man to, to wear a woman's garment, for a woman to put on that which pertains to a man. And I decided, you know what? I believe that pants is a, is a man's garment. I don't want her wearing that. Now, she disagreed with me in certain instances and stuff like that. It doesn't matter. Okay, it doesn't matter. But I had to figure out a way as a husband to say, look, this is going to happen. She's like, well, then you're going to have to buy me new clothes. And I said, yes, I will. That's fine. I will work harder. I will make extra money. I will, you know, if I'm telling you that, I mean, it only makes sense, right? That's a reasonable response. Okay, well, if you're going to tell me I can't have this, then, I mean, I'm getting rid of a lot of my wardrobe. What do you want me to wear? Fine. Work harder then. And I did work hard to make sure that we could afford, okay, fine. You could, you need to, you need it? Absolutely. But it wasn't just that. It, there, there's, there's things, and see, as the husband, as the man in the family, you need to determine what is important, where are your priorities at, and how is your house going to be run. So I'm giving you some examples of my house. Okay, you decide for yourself. You decide between God and you and what this book says, 
how your household should be run. I'm going to try to help teach you things that I believe the Bible's talking about and the standards that I believe ought, everyone ought to have in their household. But at the end of the day, it comes down to you. I'm not going to come to your house and tell you how you need to be ruling your household and your wife. That's your job as a father, as a, as a husband, to do that. Another thing that was just not even questionable in my household was church attendance. Not even a question. And I don't know if you guys noticed, but every week, barring illness or injury or something, you know, some, something reasonable that's going to keep, you know, keep my family out of church, my family's in church every single church service. And you know what? It's been that way since the day we got married. Since the day we got married. Why? Because I determined that this is important. I don't care if we just had a fight, my wife's upset with me, or whatever's going on. We're going to church. You're not staying home and pouting. You're not, you know, we're going to church. And this is the way it is. Because this is important, and this is the way that our family is going to be raised, and this is the way that our household is going to be. And I'm not saying that that was an issue either. I'm just saying that this is one of those things that was just... This is the way the household's going to be. And for me in my house, another thing was soul winning. Now, when it comes to things like church attendance or soul winning, the goal is that everybody should completely decide on their own that I want to go to church. I love church. I'm going to go there. I want to go soul winning. I love soul winning. I want to preach the gospel to people. You, you ought to have that. Everyone ought to have that heart in themselves. But there's certain times, like with like if my children say, oh, and they've complained something, oh, I don't want to go to church. I want to stay home. I want to play with you. You're going to church. Now would I rather that they just were excited saying, Yay, we get to go to church. I love to go to church. Yeah. Is that what I'm going to try to instill in them to, to, to love it and why they should love it and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. And again, as a, good, as a good leader, hopefully I'll be successful at that, at, at being able to convey that and explain that and show them the reasons why it's so important. But at the end of the day, you know what? I make the rules in the household, and my rules say, you're going to church. And, and in my household, some of, one of my rules was, we're going soul winning. I need to go soul winning. We're going soul winning. And with my wife, it was, you don't have to do any of the talking. I'm not going to force her to, to preach the gospel to someone. But I said, we're going soul winning. You're going to at least come with me. Why? Because it's important. Why? Because if my wife doesn't know how to preach the gospel, then shame on me. Because I'm not teaching her as the spiritual head of my household how to preach the gospel to every creature which is something that God commands for us to do. But if my wife is inept and not able to do it, then shame on me. There are many times we started up two different soul winning times at Faithful Word Baptist Church. Wednesday evening and then Sunday in Gilbert in our house. We had people meeting at our house. Now look, it would have been way more difficult. My, my, thank God my wife was on board. I mean, she was there. But I mean, there's times where she didn't want to go. But you know what? We were going. And that was it. And, and here's, when it comes specifically to soul winning, here's some good news. You may argue and fight, oh, I don't want to go soul winning. But I, I was just telling my wife about this yesterday. When you're in a bad mood and you're arguing and things like that, and, and you're in a fight or whatever, and then you go soul winning, by the time you're done, your whole attitude's changed. That happened every single time. I can't think of one time where we were in a bad mood or arguing or whatever, prior to just up to going out, knocking on some doors, and then afterwards still being like real angry and upset. Never happened. It's always, wow, how foolish of me to not be wanting to go soul winning. I'm so glad I went out soul winning every single time. Every single time. I mean, without fail. I cannot think of one instance where that didn't happen. Because that's the way it is. You know, sometimes your flesh says, oh, you're, oh, I don't want to do this. Oh, I'm, you know, I've got these aches and pains or whatever else. They're like, look, just go out and do it. And men, run your family that way. I mean, determine what's important to you. But for me and my family, it was, you know, soul is important. I'm going to teach my children 
that this is important. They're going to see mom and dad both going out and knocking on doors and winning souls. And I'm going to take them out and teach and train them how to do it. My seven-year-old was taking, taking part in our, in our soul winning challenge and going up to adults and trying to give them the gospel. And look, I'm not trying to, it, is, it isn't a pride thing at all. This is, you know, if a seven-year-old can do it, I think anybody can do it. There is a lot of, well, I'm going to get into that tonight. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Don't worry, we're going to have, it's, it's not a part two, but tonight is, uh, is going to be another fun sermon. Turn if you would to Exodus chapter four. Se se second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter number four. Genesis, Exodus. Now look, these things, they, they're going to cause discomfort, especially when there's, when there's things that you need to rectify or correct in the home. And it could be anything. It could be getting rid of, of sin. It could be getting, you know, you decide, you know what, there's nothing godly on TV. There's no value for this. And you're just watching garbage. And maybe there is some value in it, but, but your family's just continually watching garbage that you don't approve of and you don't want. Toss the stinking thing out. You know what? Cut it off. Don't say, oh, well, they're doing this behind my back. Get rid of it. Stop the opportunity for them to even do it behind your back. Take charge and say, this is the way things are going to be. You don't have to start off jumping to that conclusion, but when you start off saying, hey, here's the way things are going to be. This is the way we're going to do it. And you continue to not get the response. You know what? You may have to take drastic measures and say, this is the way things are going to be. It's going to be done. We're seeing an example in Exodus chapter 4 with Moses. A biblical example with Moses and a conflict that he had in his house with his wife. And this is a very serious situation in God's eyes. And we cannot overlook how serious this was to God. If Moses didn't rule his house right, God would have killed him. God was about to kill Moses in this story. This is after he appeared unto him in the, in the burning bush. And God was told him what he wanted to do. Did you know that Moses almost lost his life right after that because of a conflict in his household? Look at verse number 24 of Exodus 4. The Bible says, And it came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. Obviously there was a fight going on in the house of Moses about circumcising the child, cutting off the foreskin of their child, of their son. God came to kill him. But Moses stood his ground and said, no, you're going to do this. And he, and he made his wife do, perform the circumcision. And you could tell she was upset about it. She throws the foreskin down his feet and say, surely a bloody husband art thou to me. But you know what he did? He made sure that God's rules were being met in his household. They said, God says our son needs to be circumcised. I don't care if you want to do it or not. This is what's happening in our household. It's going to be done. But this was a serious situation. The Bible says that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. But then, of course, he didn't. Why? Because the right thing was done in his household. If Moses wasn't able to run and rule his own household, how in the world is he going to be a leader over all the children of Israel? When it comes down to taking the stand and saying, this is what God said, if he can't do that in his own house, who in the world is going to listen to him? How can he possibly do what God has for him to do? It's not going to happen. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5 again. We're going to go back to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to read another part of this, uh, this chapter. Because again, a good ruler, it's not all just dictatorship right i mentioned that before it's not just 
You don't have to be a jerk or be mean about things, but you do have to say, this is the way things are and be firm and have it be known that when you say something in your household, that's the way things are going to be. That you're not unsteady. Your yay is yay and your nay is nay. And you're not just always flip-flopping and bouncing back and forth and allowing certain things in. Say, well, I don't believe in this, but we'll do it anyways. And have just a total lack of integrity. If you, you see, here's, here's the temptation. You think that you're going to do something. When you have a conviction. And you say, I don't want things to be done this way in my household. But your wife has a completely opposite belief or whatever or wants to do something or maybe it's her flesh whatever it is and you're thinking well i'll give in to this to, to appease my wife to please her to show her that i love her even though i don't agree with it when you do that you are doing you think you're helping out the situation you think you're causing a fight to stop and your wife's going to recognize oh he loves me and everything else but you're causing yourselves way more problems way more problems by doing it that way you need to have integrity and be a man of your word which is way more important than just giving it because look the more you give in then it's going to be like oh what happens when you say no 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 okay i gave in once i'm not giving more well you gave in before you did it before if you thought it was so wrong then why did you let me do it and that that digs your own ditch right there And now you're going to expect your wife to listen to you now after you've already just compromised on your, your strong felt belief and conviction? You have nothing to stand on after that. It's, it's going to be that much harder now to earn respect. But if you say and do things and you do it the same way every time and you just say, nope, this is the way it's going to be, that's how you're going to earn respect. Now, your wife ought to respect you. Your kids ought to respect you, as according to the Bible, but it's not something that's just always freely given. You've got to earn it. They should, no matter what. But it's a lot harder for people to respect someone that is just always flip-flopping, giving in, compromising. I mean, just think about politics. Who has respect for politicians these days? Nobody does. Why? Because they talk out of both sides of their mouths, they just try to satisfy everybody and don't have any real convictions. It can't just say, no, we're not going to do this because it's not right. And I don't care if it offends a million people, but this is right and this is wrong and we're going to stick to it. Don't be a politician in your house. Be a real leader. You're not taking votes on what's right and what's wrong in your house. You're in charge. You determine what's right and wrong. And that's the way things are, ought to be run in your family. But in Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to see an admonishment to husbands to love their wives. It's not just iron fist all the time. We need to be able to, to have, be compassionate. Because look, when it boils down to it, men and women are very different. We know this. It's obvious. But innately, women want to be loved probably more than anything else. They want to feel the compassion and the love in that soft side. That's what they want. And men want to be respected. Men want to be able to say something and what he says, be respected, not challenged, you know, not, not just called an idiot or thought, you know, what they're doing is wrong. This is what men and women want. Men want their family to respect them and women want to be loved. And it, they're both important. Look, if you're, you're going to have a good marriage, you, you ought to have both. You ought, you ought, men, husbands, you need to love your wives and give them what they need just as much as it might drive you nuts and say, man, my wife doesn't respect me and that just burns you up and gets under your skin. Well, you, just as much as that happens, you might feel that way, your wife needs to be loved. Your wife needs to feel that she's important. That she that that you she means something to you, and I know firsthand the way that we view things is not the same. <laughs> Men think, how could she not see that I love her? I'm working all day and I'm paying all the bills, but that's not the the, the woman's idea of love. That's not what they're thinking about when it when it comes down to loving someone. They're, they're thinking a lot more of having the conversations 
and, and spending the time together and that type of thing. So, I mean, just, just make sure you realize that because it's, it's the truth. If, Ephesians 5, look at verse number 25. The Bible says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, we need to be loving our wives enough, and she needs to re realize this, that you're willing to give your life for her. That she really does mean that much to you that you're willing to give your entire life, lay down your life for her sake. And that's the type of love you have. And when you love someone like that, the respect will come along with that. It should. I mean, naturally, when you're demonstrating that type of love, you sh it should get through to your wife that, wow, he really does love me and in turn respect you for it. it it's a way to, to, again, not just be the dictator and just demand it like, you know, it's like the people at work, again, I'll use a work analogy, that they're given a position. So in title, they have this authority, and they just want to tell everybody what to do because they have this position, but they're a really bad leader, and they're really bad at working with people. Nobody wants to do anything that they say. Well, don't be that type of husband or that type of father in your household that just, well, I have this title, and then, you know, no, there's a lot more to it than that. Love your family, love your children, invest your time in them, and, and be a leader by example, and not just shouting off commands. So here we are, Ephesians 5, verse 25 again. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. But look at this next, the next part, because um, this is missed, missed, I think, many times. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. So Christ, yes, he, he loved the church and gave himself for it, but why? What was, the, what was the end goal and result of that then is that he might sanctify it, set apart, and cleanse it. Jesus Christ wants a, a cleansed church. He doesn't want, like, you know, are sinners welcome to church? Yeah, we're all sinners. But is that the state we ought to just stay in? Is that what Jesus Christ died for? No, we ought to be cleansing, you know, the church ought to be getting cleansed, Sin ought to be getting out of life and that we could be presented without spot and without blemish to, to God. Like that, that is the end result. So the loving that he had for us is that he might sanctify and cleanse it without the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. When we're loving our wives... The, one of the goals of loving them and one of the ways of loving them is that, hey, help them to get better and to get right with God and, and to get rid of their blemishes and, and, and you know, present your wife to you the same way that Christ is trying to present the church to himself as being holy and sanctified and without blemish and without spot. As the spiritual leader in your house, that's your job. It's not just with your children, it's with your wife also. But you have to care enough about your wife and love your wife enough to invest your time and energy into her. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. And don't let bitterness creep in. I'll, I'll read this for you, but in uh, Colossians 3, verse 19, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Very, very, very important part to having a good marriage and a good relationship and being a good leader and a good father in the home, a good husband. Don't, let, don't be bitter against your wife. That's going to cause way, way more problems. And I, this is actually something that I think that we do pretty well my per, in marriage personally. Like We have some really, really heated arguments and fights and stuff and maybe some yelling and shouting and whatever. And look, again, I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm not saying that those are, you know, even necessarily right. But we don't, we don't hold on to that. And, and you really got to make sure you don't hold on to the wrongs that have been done to you or perceived wrongs or whatever is going wrong. You know, you ought to love your wife. And even if... Um, you know, maybe your wife isn't being as submissive as she ought to be. Or you say, well, I'm reading the Bible, and I mean, like, it's so obvious here. I don't know why she's not, you know. Well, part of the reason is because this culture is just raising women to be completely rebellious and disobedient and want to have nothing to do with anyone telling them anything and being taught that we're all e you know, equal as far as who's in authority and who's in charge. 
Now look, our value is the same, but, but the authority is clearly given to the man in the household. And you might be getting frustrated by that, but don't let that brood in the bitterness. If that's happening in your house, you need to look at your wife and love her and love her enough to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some long suffering and mercy, but we're going to correct this problem. And you're going to have to approach it and, say, and, and realize and recognize that this may not change overnight. You may not get the, the humility of Sarah in the Bible calling Abraham Lord overnight. It's not going to happen. And you can't be bitter in your heart against your wife because of that. Or get covetous over someone else's wife. Oh, I wish I had Sarah for wife. Look, you, you're married to who you're married to. And you need to love your wife. You're commanded to love your wife. You ought to anyways. And you need to, to not get bitter against her when, and, and to continue to love her and to help to lead and to guide. And you ought, if, you're, if your methods aren't working out, you need to try something else and figure out a way how you're going to be able to lead in integrity without backing down, but also in a way that's going to get through and, and, and reach your wife and your children. Everyone's a little bit different. Everyone learns, a little, people respond a little bit differently to certain things. So you just need to figure that out. And if you're failing in an area, you know, figure out what's going on and identify it and, and correct the problem because the, oh, at the end of the day, it boils down to you, husbands. Ruling your house starts with your wife, but it's also very important that your children see you as the head of the household also. Raising children right and being a good father doesn't happen by accident. It's not just going to, oh, wow, it just, everything just happened to turn out okay. It's hard work. As God said of Abraham, for I know him that he will command his children and his household. He will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Why would Abraham's children keep the way of the Lord? Why would they listen to him? Why, why would they be godly and righteous children? Because he was teaching them. Because he trained them. Because he didn't just let them all do whatever they wanted. Because he was in charge and leading his household. You leave a children to themselves, they're going to turn into monsters. They're going to turn into nightmares. You, you have to tell them what to do. If you're going to be a good father, you need to lay down the law. I mean, we have a heavenly father that loves us more than we could even comprehend. And what did he do? He laid down a law for us. And the Bible says that he, that he, that he scourges every son whom he receiveth. Dads, you need to make sure that, that the law is being laid down in your household and that there's consequences for the disobedience. Do you think you can do it better than God? Of course not. And if that's the way that God does things, shouldn't we follow? I mean, he's already told us what to do. He has rules, he has limits, he has, he has mercy and long-suffering, but he also has lines where he says, no. And if you do this, guess what? You're going to reap what you sow. And if you, you disregard me, if you're stiff-necked against me, it's going to come back down on you. Fathers, you need to, to have a similar attitude. See, Abraham's children, they're going to do justice and judgment because he taught them right from wrong. I mean, that's what justice is. That's what judging, you know, knowing right from wrong. He took the time to specifically do that. It doesn't happen by accident. You can't even just bring your kids to church. I can't expect to bring my kids to church and just expect them to know right from wrong just from hearing me preach in church. I need to take the time and teach them and go over concepts and teach them right from wrong individually, every day, regularly, all the time, teaching them right from wrong. That is the only way that they're going to learn well enough to, to after my departing, after I'm gone, after I'm out of the picture, after I'm out of their lives, for them to keep serving the Lord, just like Abraham's children and his whole household. God said he knew that his, his house is going to follow the Lord after Abraham's gone. 
because of his investment and his love and the time that he spent in teaching and training. It's so vital and so important. And guess, guess what happens, dads, husbands, when you have this type of responsibility, you know what, loot, what, what is gone and what goes out the window? Your personal time. What I want to do. Well, I want to go off bowling. I want to go off fishing. I want to go off and do all this other stuff. Yeah, but you got a job to do. There's nothing wrong with those things, but if you're not doing your job right, then make sure your job is done right before you just go off and spend any time to invest on yourself and indulge in your own pleasures. You got your house in order? You got everything going well? Great. Take that time for yourself. But after, you, after you've given the time to God and after you've given the time to your family, determine your priorities and live your priorities. I already alluded to this earlier, earlier. 1 Timothy 3, 4 says, uh, in regards to a pastor, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. If you rule your house well, your children are going to know their place and be subject to you when you tell them to do or to not do something. They're going to take you seriously. That's what with gravity means. Not like Lot's sons-in-law. If you remember them. Lot's trying to warn them because the angels came and told him, hey, we're going to destroy this place. So he's trying to tell them, look, we got to get out of here. God's going to bring his judgment down. And they'd laugh at him. Like, oh, he's like one that mocks. It's just like it's a big joke. Why? Because Lot didn't invest any time in teaching them judgment. So when the judgment of God was actually coming, they thought it was just some big joke. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, that's so funny, Lot. And they got destroyed as a result of that. Take heed to the lesson you learned from that, fathers, in teaching your children judgment and justice, that they understand that there is a God in heaven that's going to judge one day. Amen. And that they need to listen to your judgments and you teaching them right from wrong so that they know, hey, this is, this is not right and God's going to end up judging. And it's not just some big joke. God's not some fairy tale. God's not Santa Claus. God's not the tooth fairy. God's real. And his judgment is real. And it's not some big joke or some big game. And you need to realize that and live your life accordingly. And like I said before, just like with your wives, it's not just being hard or mean that makes you a good parent. It's not just giving spankings that makes you a good parent. Those things may be necessary sometimes, but that's not what it's all about. You have to love your family and spend time with them. It takes more than just discipline to rule your house well. Colossians 3.21, I'll close on this verse. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger lest they be discouraged. Fathers have a... It actually, in my opinion, I think it comes a little bit easier. It definitely comes easier than with the women, I think, to, to be able to just... This is the way things are going to be in the household, with your, especially with your children and maybe give out some punishments. But we don't want to provoke our kids to wrath and, and just make them angry. You know, we don't want to, you know the buttons on your children. You don't want to just be pushing their buttons all the time and making them angry, right? We want to, we want to teach them when they ought to have a, a healthy fear so that way when they're, when they're disobeying and doing things wrong, they could expect discipline and punishment. But at the same time, they need to be loved and taught and, and it needs to be expressed to them that you care about them and, and, and you're spending the quality time with them that they need to grow up right. And spending enough time with you to see the way that you behave, that you're living a good example. You're bringing them, to, you're not sending them to church on the church bus. You're going with them to church. You're, you're showing them how to love your wife you have sons, you want your son to grow up to be a godly young man and maybe marry someone and be a great husband and a father, they're going to learn the most from you. This is the way things were done in my household. 
This is the way that dad treated my mom. This is the way that dad treated us. Makes a big impact. We know none of us are perfect, but let's, let's identify those areas where you know I need work in this area. Whether it be being consistent, put, you know, making a line in the sand, whether it be spending more time, quality time, loving, whatever that area, well, wherever it is that you're lacking, we're all lacking somewhere. Let's work on that so that we can be the best husband and the best fathers that we can be and, and, and hopefully have a testimony like Abraham had where God can say of you, I know, that, I know this man. That even when he's gone, his whole household is going to follow the Lord and do justice and judgment. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the instruction that you give us, dear Lord. We pray that you would please help us, especially the, the men, the, the fathers and the husbands, dear Lord. Help us to be the best fathers and husbands that we can be. Dear Lord, help us to receive the, the instruction from your word. God, I pray that you would please just help us to do what's right and um, to, to rule our households the way that they ought to be run, dear God, and that um, we, can, we can really get things in order and uh, be the examples, be the leaders that we need to be. And God, um, I pray that, that every man here this, this morning will, um, will be able to have that testimony that Abraham had. We thank you for, for giving us those great examples in the Bible, Lord, and we know that... Um, these things don't happen by accident. Abraham wasn't just lucky to have a, a good wife. He wasn't just lucky. He, was, he definitely was blessed, but Lord, um, there's a lot more to it than just that, and he worked real hard to, uh, to receive the testimony from you in, his, in your word, dear Lord, and I pray that you please help us all to be able to, um, that you'd be able to say the same things about us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.